Hello. So, you're probably wondering what this extra video is about, because I said there was only going to be seven videos for the 20s and 1930s carriers. Well, I also said that I was going to do the last set of questions that any came up that really needed a good response. And by good response, I mean a long one, not one I can quickly answer in a nice sort of message chat away on the chat, uh, comments. I would respond to in Brew Ships on Sunday, today. Brew Ships 32, I think it is. And, well, Brew Ships 32 is happening. But there have been a lot of questions, and there are a lot of big books of Brew Ships 32. And so I'm free. It's Saturday. I have Iron Brew. I have been running around all day doing nutty, nutty things but that you have to deal with when you're in lockdown and various other things. I come with mainly to helping out, sorting out family who have all been having issues in lockdown. And frankly, I felt like doing a video and I felt like answering these questions. So, without much further ado, I'm going to put this up here. It might be a clue as to where some of the questions are coming from. So let us go back to the ones which hadn't been responded to. So pretty much any questions which came in after Tuesday. So if I go all the way down to them, and all the way down to Tuesday, and there have been a lot of comments, which I really enjoy, and I do like getting a lots of questions, because it gives me lots of stuff to discuss and think about, and it, I find the ideas I get back as interesting, I hope, as the ideas I put out. Well, I hope the ideas I put out are as interesting as them, because otherwise, seriously, people will be coming to my channel for the comment section. It's a really cool comment section. Does take a long time to scroll down comments on YouTube. So, I'm up to five days ago, and around about a hundred or so comments ago. It's been lots of fun. Well, there were lots of videos. Right. So now, scrolling along. And basically, I can take it anyone's from part four, definitely. We're all after I had done the video. So. Here's a good question from Anonymous. Japanese fleet carriers also carried crated spares, usually three to five, well, on paper, uh, after 1944, not so much. German ships often had one spare plane in a crate, also intended for spares. You read the... Uh, Anonymous says they read these facts somewhere. Anonymous is one of those lovely people who does like to give very good comments. And I have to credit them on that one. They also give very fulsome replies and chats in the chat when we're talking and we're doing a live. Have to admit, also anonymous, I do, do have to admit, and I think this is probably going to have to stand as well for to today's brew ships, did fall afoul of the no politics discussion, because current politics is very, very tempting. There is all sorts of stuff, but there is a reason me, Drac, Jamie, deal that in bilge pumps. And you're going to enjoy bilge pumps this week. And you're going to enjoy Bill Trump's, well, this week, as in this week, but uh, the week we've been through and the week that's coming. But that, because there's all lots of stuff in that, but there's a reason we deal with it there. Because there we can make sure everything comes out. I'm not going to say as we necessarily want it, but correctly, in that we are very sure of what's being said and the content, and we are very sure we do our best to filter out any of the weird stuff which can crop up in the world, which is highly dubious. 
academic version of weird stuff is not something which normally would be might be called weird, but is stuff which it has one source, and that source is how do I put this? More like a sentence from the Hokey Cokey than it is like a sentence from Encyclopedia Britannica. Though you might find the Hokey Cokey in Encyclopedia Britannica. In fact, enough. Yes, I, Japanese and German ships always car I did carry spares. I've made a dealt with this before. I think I possibly did. But it's also something the French, everyone carries various forms of spares. One of the interesting concepts that you find in the British carriers is that Americans are carriers. They carry com fully completed aircraft stored up in the rafters of the fl of the hangar deck. And they basically they have too much of a problem with aircraft. It goes over the side. They bring down a new one. Put it together. The British... Their policy is boxed, breaked up cr uh, crates of components. But the joke often is they probably have enough components they could assemble whole aircraft. And in fact, at some points during World War II, you do find aircraft magically appear which didn't exist technically before. In places which are not factories. Specifically, certain gladiators turn up from spare parts. Sea gladiators turn into air defense fighters from Malta called Faith, Hope, and Charity. Um, Faith, Hope, and Charity, I think. The swordfish we have been, we have talked about swordfish on many occasions. The fact is that when you're dealing with the fleet air arm, this is the difference in many ways between the fleet air arm and various other forces. Our forces have a bad day. They are hunting everywhere for aircraft. The Royal Navy Fleet Air Arm has a bad day. Yes, they lose aircraft, but within about five minutes, someone going, Oh, we got some radar equipped swordfish over there. Where did they come from? We have no idea. They just. You, you just leave a single swordfish alone in a hangar for about five minutes and you walk back and there's two more. It. When you say that the Royal Navy in World War One is the sort of navy which, oh, we've just found another cruiser down the back of the sofa. In World War Two, they're the navy which goes, just found half a dozen swordfish. I I swear, one of these days we're going to run across a hangar or an airfield somewhere in the world from World War Two, and it's going to be full of swordfish, and everyone's going to go, but those didn't exist. And it's going to be found they were com they, they were just built of spare parts which were hanging around just in case they were needed. I, 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 I'm so surprised we haven't yet found one like that, considering the amount of stuff we have pulled up. And before people think that this stuff hasn't been left around the world, it has. These things get forgotten. It's presumed they were damaged, or they are built by a one commander who then moves, and then another person, and the, the, the people who generally know move, and frankly, the base fell behind the lines, and no one went back to check, and then they just presumed it's all been cleared, because someone else was supposed to clear it. It's also, I have to admit, one of my big problems with DJ Holmes's Empire Rising series is the bomber is called a Lancaster, the fighter is Spitfire, and the interceptor, which is super light, is called a Corsair. This is in the most recent book, um, uh, number 10, episode, uh, part 10. Excuse me, there are fight a bomber deployed off a carrier. If they're not called swordfish, there is something wrong going on here. I love the books, but seriously? Uh, your heavy fighter attack aircraft is the Spitfire, and your interceptor is the Corsair. Again, I love the books, but you're play doing things to my mind here, because these are not the way around they're supposed to be. And yes, it is built by the Britannic Royal Space Navy, Spitfire and Lancaster. But again, if they were built by the Royal Navy, they wouldn't be called the Spitfire and Lancaster. The Royal Navy has all sorts of really, really cool fighter names to call from. And all sorts of bomber names to call from. 
Uh, we pro wouldn't probably go for the albacore, but let's be honest. There's the Barracuda. It's a cool name. The aircraft wasn't so good, but you know. Uh, if they want a long range reconnaissance aircraft, I had spots for battleships. I, I, I know what my channel would suggest that'd be called. Um, there's the Swordfish. Corsair was used by the Royal Navy, of course. You can say that one. And this was Hellcat and Wildcat, but. No. No, there is better. There are other ones. Firefly. Oh, that would sound good. But let's be honest, if we're going for a attack aircraft for the fleet air arm in the fighter form, there's only one real name. Sea Fury. Or Fury. He would work and come on, that's the name of a space fighter. The Furies are inbound. Launch the Fury. It just it just sounds good. Anyway, getting back to the comments. So, and that comment was Anonymous on part four, aircraft carriers in the 1920s and 30s. Then we all sorts of things. Let's see. Then we have part five, another one from Anonymous, which has a reply from Trauco 1388. So I'll read both out. Anonymous, the German surface navy was not expecting to be at war at all. Its self-perception was as a rational deterrent force to stabilise normalizer. They were basically expecting to be Britain's Baltic and White Sea deputies. I this one does go around quite regularly, but I don't see it as such um, a simple case than that. I think uh, they are far more. The, the German Navy has a plan, and it is deterrence and sort of all these things, but I think this is going to sound very strange, considering the lessons of World War One. but I honestly think the German Navy is pursuing a risk fleet strategy again. Not a specific risk fleet strategy as announced, announced with the Navy laws and those things which directly challenge the British. But I think they are looking at the world and they are wondering how big do we have to be to be a bite which the British do not want to fight because the damage will mean they'll be open up in the Far East to Japan or the Mediterranean to the Italians. And so I don't think it, it's not a case of they, ha they are going to be the big bite or the big threat. They, real they realize they're not going to get funding. They're not aiming for that like Japan is. But they want to be comprehensive, at least as comprehensive as the Italians are. And I honestly think the fact that the Italians don't have carriers is quite strange, considering it's down to politics and it's down to the issues they have. But when you start talking about Mare Nostrum, to make it more than uh, make it more than a hollow jest, you do have to be able to expand into the other ends of the Mediterranean. You cannot just control the centre of the Mediterranean. You need to expand to the east and to the west. And if you can't do that, you're in trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. And then Trago 1388 has put Hitler wanted a bargaining ship and a prestige fleet to show the flag. Raider wanted anything that he could get without a clear idea for what or whom again against whom. Again, this is sometimes put forward, especially by people who are, uh, in some ways, I would say, apologists for the German Navy. Um, and the whole idea that they aren't part of, they're somehow separate from the government and nation they're part of. And they're not. But also, they do have a rational idea. They do know what they're building up. Look at Plan Z. Look what it's building up towards. As I said, rationally, they have worked out they can't. They aren't going to get to be Japan. If they start building like Japan is building, there is no chance that Britain's not going to respond. There is no chance that France, Russia, is not going to respond immediately. 
before the moment those ships enter the slipway, they are not going to be allowed to enter service. Again, this is a different world. If you consider since 1945, the onus has certainly been far less often. The actual formal war has is far less often to be declared, actually declared because of the legalities and the issues that have come up with the post-45 settlement in sort of the United Nations and the various organizations which have stood up in the world. All these are a factor. They're not a factor in the 1920s and 30s. In the 1920s and 30s, you had the League of Nations, which can do... Well... Look at the, consider the last few years of the world with the as he is current president of the United States. Whatever your views on him, the UN hasn't been of the force in the world. But it's not just been him. You go to Obama, again, um, he isn't using the UN so much. You go back further, Bush. In fact, for a president who really made use of the UN, you have to go back pretty much to Clinton. And there is a, there is a small reality which is taking place if the major powers are not going to work through the united nations the united nations doesn't have power if you have america not being a member as it was of the league of nations if you have britain and france prepared to do deals with people outside of the league of nations and basically, even though they're going to make a stink out of things in the United Nations, not be prepared to provide the troops, ships, aircraft, lives, and money, which are needed to enforce its decisions, might as well not be there. It's a shop. It's a talking shop. This is though the post forty five we're dealing with. Pre forty five. In the 30s, as I said, I think the the German plan is actually quite realistic if you take it that they are not contending to be the primary aggressor. That's not their plan. They want someone else to be their hunting dog at sea. They don't want to get into that fight again. The Navy doesn't. They know how it ended. They know how it will end. Which is often the funny thing, because if, let's say, war had come in the 1940s, the British shipyards would have been built up, were building up just as rapidly as the American ones at this point. They just were cut, or the war started two years earlier for them. So they hadn't fulfilled their full turnaround. You have the war in the mid-1940s, you are facing a completely different world. You're facing a Royal Navy which has four battle carriers, three strike carriers, and a brand new cruiser carrier. Slash, not a carrier, support ship. Slash, HMS Unicorn. And that's a very different navy. Built around fast battleships. Two generations of them. Interesting thing would be what would happen, which ships would have gone first. I th it would definitely be the R class battleships. But after that, I wouldn't be surprised if Repulse goes. Hood might go, depending on how big a refit they're prepared to do. Queens, which haven't been upgraded, will go. 
Basically, it'll be the unrefitted ships which will go first, and then they'll start working for the others. Cruiser-wise, that's a whole different ball game. Expect to see that quadruple six-inch turret make, a, make an appearance. Now, I'm just going to say thank you to Bill Bolton, Bruce Marino, Nathaniel Poole for your very nice comments. And then we're up to part five. We're on Long Patrol part five, and we've got the reason I have this picture here. Could Burn have been used as an escort carrier, as she's nowhere near good enough for fleet operations, but for ASW work, she might have been good enough. Well, I'm going to read the, the full comments, because De uh, that's from John South, the first one. Then Deeks25 has commented, From what I gather, she is pr it was in pretty poor condition. By the time she joined the Free French Navy, and so bringing her back into full operational status was cost prohibitive i.e. it was cheaper to just build more escort carriers, particularly as they are a uniform design and Burn was a one-off. But she was a functional hull, so they put Burn into an aircraft transport role and free up escort carriers for, from that role. Uh, well, to free up an escort carrier. The other question is, could she have been able to operate things like TBF Avenger? Aircraft had got, has, have got a lot bigger and heavier since she had been commissioned. Um, all the Japanese carriers had the same problems. Their lifts, catapults, and rest of gear just weren't designed for the new generation of aircraft. I believe the introduction of the A7M was held up by its larger size compared to the A6M. Yep. And then John South responded, Deeks 25, she was in terrible condition in late war, useless, but if she'd been sided with free French one, she would have been a godsend in 1940-42, and she was able to do use the Dauntless. It should also be noted that Bern would not have been restricted as much as Japanese carriers as the French used twin-engine planes during the interwar years. Tr all true. My instinct is if Bern had sided with the Free French in 1940, then you would have had her used. The Royal Navy would not have turned down an operating carrier. They'd have found a place for her. <sighs> Escort carrying role? Possibly the anti-submarine warfare carrier, that sort of role. Um, not exactly a fast carrier, but she could carry fighters, and she could carry strike aircraft, and knowing the British, they would slam some cranes on her within about five minutes and stop the arrangement with the lifts just because that's their methodology. They'd figure out a way of getting it to work. Um, probably cut some holes in the deck and sort it out that way. She would have been used. Escort carrier, quite probably... into a probably anti-surface radar carrier and strange enough you might have seen her attached to forces to make up for deployment to the far east so again it's an extra carrier available earlier on it's going to allow them to accelerate production in some ways it's going to allow them to protect other productions and it's going to make the issues more difficult for the germans in others an extra hole in the water is always going to be beneficial and you're going to find a way to use it they found a way to use Argus. They will find a way to use the burn. Possibly even resupply of Malta again. Another another hull for that or those operations. <laughs> it's another carrier. There is nothing wrong with having another carrier for that sort of thing. Whether she would come over after... Yeah, she probably would have still come over after the various operations the British did, but, you know, another group of people not very happy with the British for what they did to the French fleet. But uh, there again, they might well have been, uh, might have a senior officer there who could talk some sense into the Admiral there. Getting off that. I'm not mentioning it by name because I don't want to turn that into that discussion. And this was another comment on part four, and this is from Stu Ross. 
Considering that Ryujo was an attempt to build a fleet carrier below 10,000 tons, but was too lightly built, should navies have considered building slower escort carriers for non-fleet tasks? The bow conversions were just under 10,000 tons, or were the later CVs used only in open ocean and submarine tasks, or if you had achieved no supremacy in the area when you, where you, oper you wanted to operate CVs? Technically, if the rules had existed so that ships below 10,000 tons no longer still didn't count towards your total carrier tonnage, you can guarantee at least one navy, if not two other navies, maybe even three other navies, thinking off the top of my head, probably even Australians and Canadians, possibly on this one, I would have considered small carriers below 10,000 tons. It would have been something you sort of have, and it all started working on various versions of what in peacetime would be called cruiser carriers. Rather than sort of escort carriers. But it's because it counts at a tonnage, so it's the, it's the London Naval Treaty, basically, that stops that one. And it's inarguably, it's the British who stop it. And mainly the British stop it because, not because they're anti-carrier. Definitely not. But it is because they're stopping it because they're worried about how many Japan would proliferate with Ryujo's like. And America also worried about that. Uh, it, it's trying to keep Japan... It, it, the question is, yes... We can use these carriers, but we have the capacity to build them up in wartime. And if it's wartime, the treaties don't count anyway, because we'll stop taking any notice of them. But it's to stop Japan being able to build up a huge fleet in peacetime. Because Japan doesn't have the infrastructure and build industry to be able to build up and continue to build up in wartime. The British notice, the Americans notice. So that's the calculation. It's not about whether we could use these ships or not. It's about can we prevent more Ryujos. Okay. Now on to aircraft carriers of the 1920s, part five, and 20s and 30s, part five. Uh, the ME-109 would have fallen to bits if launched from accelerator and landing gear would suddenly collapse or the aircraft or the aircraft cut with landing. They could have come with a naivalized F-190. FW um, well, Trauco1388 has responded to Guido R's comment here. Uh, you are right, it would have no doubt ended up with a pilot flying by himself like in a cartoon. Impossible for it to do it, right? Yeah, much better to navalize a fighter with 200 kilometer la uh, landing speed than needed people to stand on wings to guide the pilot while taxiing on the ground due to atrocious visibility. Okay, neither F4W90 or the ME109 were great fighters, okay? For naval operations. Guess what? Neither was the Seafire. Great once it was in the air. It was lovely once it's up there. It's beautiful. Landing, taking off. Yeah. My choice due to landing speed would probably be the ME109. But then trying to navalize it, but honestly, the. The easiest way to navalize it, that they don't seem to have put much thought or effort into it, is expanding the wings and making the control surfaces bigger so it can slow down more and still retain lift. That is basically what you'd have to do. Having the trolley system that they're using for their, their launches is how they're getting around the landing gear and the accelerator. Okay, that's why they're using the trolleys. No one else, no other reason can there be for using putting such a system which is going to limit your aircraft numbers so much than you than that. It's to protect your landing gear uh, in, from the force of takeoff. The fact that they also have to accord to Luftwaffe space regulator requirements is also an impact on their um, hangar space. Ah, fun times. Anyway. Right, Shane F now. 
uh, part four. Just thank you for the nice comment. Good luck with the cats. Anonymous. I can name exactly zero twin engine carrier based aircraft from World War II. Well, I'm going to read John Rodriguez's points and then I'm going to start talking myself. And this was your comment on part seven. The closest you, John Rodriguez, uh, the closest you come to a twin engine aircraft ca air carrier aircraft was the carrier cable Grumman F7 Tiger Cat. Uh, the Navy didn't like it. I can't remember why, so the Marines ended up flying it. The British did test, however did not buy a four-engine reconnaissance plane for the carriers. Describe this thing as trying to overcome wing, wind resistance with blunt force trauma is an understatement. Um, I can't remember, but I think it was called the Sea Shadow, I think. We're not going to get into the Sea Shadow. Uh, and John Andrew Bend. There was also the Havilland Sea Hornet that just missed the war, and the F-5F Skyrocket that was only used by the Blackhawks. John Rodriguez to Andrew Bend, forgot all about the F5F, uh, good call. Actually, the British are testing variations of the Mosquito, Hornet, and other things that come up throughout the war. They keep looking at the twin engine, and basically it comes down to space. Their ships have been designed around single engine aircraft. But... They're looking at it. They want it. So there are lots of development going on there because it would be useful. And again, the French do have twin-engined aircraft throughout the interwar period for the burn and various other things. The Royal Navy would have liked them. If they'd had a larger carrier, me and Drac aren't insane. We are quite logical in this one. The reason they'd have gone it uh, gone for it is because again their number they had air group limitations by maintenance and by the fact they had to fight the fleet air and all these things uh, for the fleet air arm with the fleet air ministry. So they would have been going for a twin engine aircraft because of the range. Remember, what are the British seeking? Look at the Royal Navy and look what it's seeking throughout the interwar years in terms of aircraft. It's seeking long range night strike. And for that, it needs the most reliable aircraft it can get that can carry the most weight the furthest. Twin-engined is always more reliable than single-engined. Always. It allows you to carry a lot more weight and have a heavier aircraft, which means it can take a lot more fuel. and a bigger payload. A twin-engined attack aircraft would probably carry a pair of torpedoes rather than a single one. Imagine that. Now, it's also going to have probably wider wings that need to be sorted out, and I'm not sure how you do Toronto in that circumstance, but I'm fairly sure the Royal Navy would have figured it out. There are options. And here is the other bet I have. If that had been what had happened, the Royal Navy would have would have had to. Not only get control earlier of the fleet air arm from the Air Ministry, but they would have had to seriously consider cannon for their fighter aircraft, and for all their aircraft as their main armament. Now, why do I say this? Because if you have the Royal Navy flying twin-engine aircraft and the French Navy flying twin-engine aircraft, you can guarantee the USN and the IJN are going to at least try it out. And if everyone's getting bigger aircraft, it could lower down the air groups of the other two, a tad. And also, let's be honest, if you're talking about Admiral class aircraft carriers, which is what this, I'm presuming this comment is in relation to, rather than courageous, glorious, and furious, 
there probably isn't going to be much difference between their air group size and Saratoga and Lexington. Other than the Americans going, we need a third one. We need parity. And the British going, we might let you have one, but you're gonna ha are you going to have to build it from scratch? Or are you going to have to, you know, are you going to get another conversion? What other ship are you going to convert? It's an interesting question to actually answer. What would be the third ship they'd convert if the British had free Admiral class aircraft carriers? Because, hmm, I'm not sure what they would do, but it would be interesting. And again, the other question is, would the British also get a similar obsession with having 8-inch guns on their carriers? We'd hope not. We'd all hope not. Considering the British comments about um, uh, weight, I doubt it. Right then. Let's move on to part 7 still. Uh, I promise. Uh, Japan in 1941 was optimal for attacking because almost all its force structure was built already and everyone was under arms. Hiyo and Yuno and one small ca carrier are all that come out in the first year of war. Misashi and Yamato are meaningless and their 1944 carriers have untrained air crews on Isla's too. I'm now going to read John Rodriguez's point, Rodriguez's point and then I'm going to read Anonymous's reply. Was the fuel embargo initiated by the United States to try and stop Japanese expansion in China and China? And Japan realized that they had two years of fuel and then their fleet would be useless. They felt painted in the corner, into a corner and culturally they could not stop their expansion without losing face. I mean, politically, I wonder what could have been different. I don't think there is anything, but it may have saved us a lot of lives. The United Kingdom and France had kicked off in support of Poland and invaded Germany. World War II could have been averted there. That is the last checkpoint that could have stopped the European part of the war. The Italians' performance in the war was predictable, since their attack and subsequent victory in Ethiopia required le lethal gas attacks. Without those attacks, they, they probably would have lost in Ethiopia. Um, John Rodriguez, uh, anonymous response to John Rodriguez, the US oil and steel embargoes were intended to force Japan to at least abandon you know, China. The US government knew those two embargoes would destroy the Japanese economy within six, at least, to 24 months at most. The US was not trying to drive Japan to war, was also indifferent to that possibility. The embargoes were the proper US strategy. A better Japanese response would have been to withdraw from Indochina and see if that's enough to get the US to lift sanctions. If it wasn't, then attack the British and Dutch, only reoccupy, only reoccupy Vietnam, and then attack Vladivostok. Germany dust defeats USR, and USA has no easy entry into the war. Fortunately, its credentials are rigid, secretive, distrustful, and suck at alliance points. Politics. On paper, the Axis might have won, but given its inability to coordinate effective strategy, it was doomed from the start. There is no nice, bloodless scenario. Japan was militarist and intended to displace European imperialists with the greater Japanese empire and co-prosperity sphere. Okay. Going through all that. I would say Japan would have been far better off waiting till 42 to start war if it had been slice, but I think it is forced its hands. A mid 40, a mid 40s are probably the best time for the Japanese to end up war in uh, a second world war, and that was certainly where they were hoping for. Just like the Germans, the Italians, the Brits, the Americans, everyone was planning on the mid 40s, and it happened six years early. Because if you consider 1945 is the mid 40s in the kickoff point, 39 is six years early, 41 is four years early. It's it's not good for any of them. It's not enough time to prepare and have the infrastructure in depth to support the operations. Saying that, there is no scenario, absolutely no scenario I can see where Japan attacks any European power in the Pacific and doesn't find America getting involved. And I say this for two reasons. America considers the Pacific their backyard. They do. I'm sorry, everyone else in the world, but they do. Far more than they consider the Atlantic it to be. The Atlantic is a shared space. The Pacific is the, is the American space. And the American sphere of influence. The European powers, including Britain, are, at least in times of peace, prepared to tolerate. 
the Americans taking that lead as in the 1920s and 30s to an extent. But that tolerance is based on the fact that if China attacks you, then in form at least, America will attack them. Also, there is the point about Japan invading Russia. Well, they've already been beaten up several times. In fact, the whole reason Stalin waits to invade Poland is because he's beating up the Japanese. So, good luck with that one. The Japanese army is very, very capable in so many, many ways. But they found that the Russians of 1939 were not the Russians of 1905 or 1904. They were... A far different set of creatures in terms of war fighting. So, no. It's just not the same. There is no bloodless part uh, scenario, and there is no scenario I see with war breaking out in the Pacific between anyone and Japan that does not lead to America being involved. So if, if you're Japan, you have to take out America. And you can't afford to lose the face internally to the politics by uh, giving in to the American, uh, American blockade and their you know embargo. It just won't work. Domestically. Also, we have another comment from Anne on us. I did say a lot of comments from Anne. Seaplane tenders were very useful for reconnaissance, would also be good for search and rescue. Plus, they didn't count towards the Washington Naval Treaty. And John Reduce's point, they were also very effective offensively, in particularly in the Pacific. For example, the PBY Catalina Black Cats, they were living nightmares for the Japanese. Often these crews did not return, and to this day we have no idea where the aircraft went down. They still went out night after night knowing the risk. Amazing. They were. All right, then. Part 5. Spencer Jones, as related to Joffre, it seems to me the French probably would have been better off trying to license the Yorktown design. Now, the response from this is, for Atlantic, that would have been fine. For the Mediterranean, not so sure, considering their position in the Pacific vis-a-vis -vis infrastructure, again, might not be the sensible choice for them, but certainly a better idea. Spencer Jones' response there, Dr. Clark, true, but having the design in, say, 1933 or 34 means that a couple of them are likely to have been built or close enough to flee by the time France falls, and if they go over to the Free French, all sorts of butterflies will result. Plus, I suspect that... Uh, in the Med and in general, they would probably have gotten with one dive bomber, one torpedo, and two fighter squadrons. Mm, still wouldn't like them in the Mediterranean, but we'll leave that to one side. Uh, I have a feeling the first JU 87 or uh, 88 that comes over and drops a very big bomb is going to cause a lot of trouble on a Yorktown design. Uh, Taraco 1388. Jones, the French. Spencer Jones, the French lacked the large shipways needed for fast battleships and carriers, which is why Joffre was delayed. The Rickloos were using the only two suitable ones. They would have had to buy some of the carriers from US, a political no-no. Then Spencer Jones. Response. I was more so thinking that with a design that they had to pay foreign currency for, the French might have started dockyard expansions they'd commenced in the late 30s, a few years earlier, which might also help to get the first two Rickloos done faster. The French dockyards are a mess. That's the big problem. Just won't happen. It's a nice idea, but it won't happen. And I think, honestly, probably a British carrier design would have been better for the French to pursue. Um, Richard Orta has worked at, has found out that the blimp whose crew went missing. This is to part one of the nineteen twenty uh, carriers, nineteen twenty six carriers. Did do the, uh, did go, uh, the blimp crew went missing? Went on to be Goodyear blimp. Yes, it did. Then we have Deeks 25, part 5. Uh, you can imagine the Royal Navy, upon hearing the, the grass was at sea, 
alone, screaming free XP and then falling over itself to hunt it down, and probably requiring a huge argument with the, fle uh, with the fleet air on RF as to who actually gets to kill it. My understanding was that the biggest problem uh, that the Grass Zeppelin had was that not the ship, I gather she had some per command mobilization or design, or the aircraft she expected to operate. It was down to the fact that the politicians, not the Kriegsmarine, were the ones say, uh, saying they needed an aircraft carrier. Kriegsmarine knew, like the H-Class and Plan Z ships, that this was not what they needed. They needed more destroyers, a light cruiser design that wasn't scared of the open ocean, and more Admiral Hitler-class ships, as well as all the U-boat industry could produce, not an aircraft carrier, while Hitler saw at the Japanese USN Royal Navy with these huge, grand-looking ships and shouted, I want one, we must have one. No concept of how to be used. Trauco 1388 responded, Nope, the Kriegsmarine wanted carriers from the start. Wait. The UK, uh, and then he goes on, the UK was so concerned about the Graf Zeppelin that they tried to bomb it several times. They weren't clueless and knew what carriers could do, could come as. And Trauco 38 goes on, it is the aircraft carrier, Graf Zeppelin, which is likely to provide a most disagreeable problem. If this ship, accompanied by Bismarck, or one of the Scharnhorst, were to break out, we would have to be prepared, uh, prepared for very uh, serious depredation to our trade. In good however, the aircraft carrier could reconnoiter some 20,000 square miles in one day, could hardly fail to locate some of our large convoys. Her reconnaissance would serve equally to defend the attackers from our hunting groups. This power of evasion might enable raids to be pressed to the western approaches, our most vulnerable area. The conclusion is that Bismarck herself is not likely to prove the menace that would first seem likely. It's the aircraft carrier which is going to turn the scales in favour of any raider. Now, the point here is that I made the point of her going out and operating solo, which was what some Germans were talking about. The point of her operating in a task group is very true. Her with a, uh, with a suitable, powerful ship, probably a Bismarck, or a Scharnhorst type, or both Scharnhorst, would certainly be very dangerous. But, I have to admit, actually, I, the reason I really wanted to bring this coming up is Deeks and Traco for, are both right and both slightly wrong, but both right. Slightly wrong in that Deeks is thinking that the Navy didn't want the carrot, they really did, and Traco in not really responding to the point that, as I'm making it was a carrier on its own, but also that Deeks was right over the light cruisers. The big weakness for the German Navy was their lack of light cruisers. It was a really, really big weakness. And if they'd had some decent light cruisers, that would have made the task forces that much stronger in every scenario. And that's on part five. That's uh, thank you to GWT Pict, Carl Van Gasberg, Shane F, and Deeks25 for their nice comments out there. And then we've got to... John Rodriguez on part 7. Here's something to ponder. Prior to our advent of kamikaze attacks in the Battle of Laity Gulf, armored decks would have been helpful for the United States Navy, but not have had as much significance if there were no kamikaze. If that had not started, we would probably still be arguing armored flight decks to this day, well, at least to a much more vigorous level. In the Pacific, armored flight decks didn't come into their own until the Royal Navy armored carriers were attacked by kamikazes. I acknowledge that they were proven in the, uh, they, that they were proven in the Mediterranean. Um, I think that's slightly edited, because my original response was, Kamikaze certainly in the Pacific did it, but for the RN experience, especially the Mediterranean, of the German anti-shipping, also showed the strengths of the policy. And that's basically it. If you're going to be attacked heavily, armored flight, the, uh, uh, the armored hangar scenario works well. Uh, part 7 again. Aircraft carriers in the 1920s and 30s. John Rigorius, Dutch Clark. I would challenge that you are very aware that there are people with doctorates that have no passion. And they can breed primary source, and they can regurgitate it, yes, but they can't interpret it. Thank you. I... That comment is very, very nice. And I have to say, I do think, yeah, but it carries on from the point of the point of... There is a lot of good history in the world. There is a lot of great research going on. I get annoyed, I have to admit, and when I was recording it, I was slightly wound up by some points on the thing where people go, oh, da-da-da-da-da, and this is the people's interpretation of history, and I go, whose interpretation of history? Which of the history books published in the last 20 years have said that? Um, 
you know, the ones that should get taught in schools. Where is this history, this idea of history coming from? Where do you think this idea of history is coming from? That this nation has this perceptive of history. One of those is when people say, oh, this is all covered up in history. Who's covering it up? The historians are usually talking about it. But anyway, uh, that's all current politics, so I'm going to keep out of that for this one. It'll probably be coming up in Belgium at some point. Andrew Cox has put forward a very good idea for how to fix the uh, the um, the grass zeppelins rails in part five again uh you could have the rails made from a corrosion resistant nickel base alloy just have to wait 20 to 40 years while it's developed otherwise i assume you've ever had a rapid replacement assembly capability or knowing engineers as i am one some complex washing system to keep the rails salt free and properly properly lubricated they didn't have either but i'm sure they were trying it Traco 1388 has also done some lovely comments on part 7 talking about the G's, uh, about um, the spacing between aircraft and hangars. The, there is one point I'm going to make, okay? Air, uh, I, I know this happens and people do this all the time, but it isn't actually grammatically correct. Aircraft works if you're saying I have seven aircraft or I have one aircraft. There is no need for an S on the end. I know some people, and one particular nation does like to do it a lot, but it isn't the truth. It's the one area where I actually get very picky in English. Some great comments from Carl van Gasberg uh, on this one, part 7. They can't hit back at you. You can have multiple airways for a single carrier, like three complete sets of fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo bombers. One on deck, one on training, and one in rest. So if planes go down, get shot down and pilots are lost, you replace them within weeks at a time, most, maybe even days. A battleship like the Bismarck, even after sinking hood, should have spent months in repair, even if it had made it to Brest. Which, of course, it didn't. Eh, it happens. Some lovely comments from Stafford Thompson, Jonathan Evans, Stephen Conroy, and... Glenn McGivy, I do love your jokes. They make me laugh. And thank you for reminding me I'd forgotten the postal link. And there is one last question, which has come up, which uh, actually there's a couple last questions, actually. On part seven, there's one coming while I've been making this video. Talk about very interesting series of talks. One question, how much different, if any, would development of aircraft carriers have been if they had all been designed from the start as aircraft carriers and not as most carriers were uh, at this time, conversions or finished of part, part for ships? I think you would have seen a more gradual increase in size. I think it would have been a more organic. Instead of what you get is a sort of jump to the big ones and then go, oh, the big ones work really well before they really figured out what the small ones do, and then World War II happens when they get a chance to figure out what the small ones really do. And the only Navy which has really figured out what the small ones do is the Royal Navy, which is one of the reasons why the, I think the US Navy has some of the issues it has with escort carriers at the beginning. Because the Royal Navy basically goes, well, how do we operate Hermes, Eagle, and Argus? Oh, we know. Let's operate these things like it. The US Navy has more, to, uh, has more time trying to pick it up. And Nick Vorhaden, uh, maybe the Reichsmarine pre-1935 Kriegsmarine should have been lo looked into Henderson's playbook and made a Zeppelin carrier for a large uh, flat la air flight landing deck, which is in no means uh, contended to con uh, conduct aircraft operations, but it's a Zeppelin supply ship that needs a large storage area and large powerful lips to supply the, carry uh, the, uh, the um, Zeppelin stock uh, very quick and fast. And because it's only for civilian purposes, there are no ca casemates for 15 centimeter guns. That would have been actually have been an interesting thing if they had divided, basically said they were creating a um, self-propelled floating Zeppelin system to go, be deployed to spaces for the Zeppelins to come down in, in sort of very distant ports. 
I don't think it, I think the British would have found some way to make it illegal, but it would have been very interesting. Hmm. And Bill Bolton has made a comment on the Battle of Stromboli, which I presume is to do with this more than this subject of the than that one. The Germans did not always overcomplicate the designs to their practical demonstrant. Consider Kurt Tank's FW 190 designed to be rugged and reliable. There's a good YouTube video by Greg on the plane. The observer uh, may see. I often take opportunity to direct viewers his way, and it's not his. Uh, and if it's that, if that's not maritime enough, check out his latest on the Catalina. Well, I did check out his latest on the Catalina, and it's very good. And so he does good work. The Germans do not always over-engineer stuff, but they certainly have a tendency in that direction. Anyway. I hope you've enjoyed part eight. It's been long, rambling, and about an hour, about an hour. But um, thank you very much for watching, and take care. See you later. Bye. Cheers. Oh, and thank you to everyone who's a watcher, subscriber, liked the videos, has joined the Discord, or is even a patron. Is a patron. You're all very, very much appreciated. You all. You've all made this channel what it is, because responding and working and listening to you and talking back for you has given me so many ideas and really helped me at points when I was having issues with editing and just a bit worn out due to all the things of lockdown, etc., which everyone else is going through, so I'm not claiming anything special here. But um, yeah, this channel and the audience have been amazing. Thank you, everyone. And it's, as I said, it's carrying on. Take care.